in this video will show how we chose the best words and phrases to teach first, most rapidly increased learner communicative proficiency with beginning learners. We'll take some of our examples from our most developed unit, which is the Dakota language version. We'll be the Tonka to all the Dakota partners who helped to develop that work. I say multiple times throughout this course that we want to choose the constructions or the language chunks that we teach in a strategic manner. We want to choose the highest leverage chunk that we can to maximize students' ability to communicate and use the language as quickly as possible with the minimum of teaching, maximize use with a minimum of teaching, basically. And that that's what highest leverage is, that the highest leverage chunks are those that are going to be reusable, recyclable in a maximum number of situations, even if they're not always going to be um, the exact most natural or most idiomatic or most um, elegant uh, phrases, um, other than situations where there's real cultural specificity that something really needs to be said a certain way. Other than that, I'm always trying to choose chunks to teach that are going to be the easiest for them to grasp and the most useful in the most situations as quickly as possible so that they're gaining the, a maximum of communicative ability and therefore a maximum of confidence and enthusiasm and motivation. Students might sound funny, they might sound a bit odd, they might sound like learners when they communicate in the early stages because I've given them very specific phrases to use. And that's okay, they are learners, so they sound like learners. Building up native speakers' tolerance for learners is a separate issue. I plan to make a video about that soon. It is, it is an interesting topic and we do run into more and less tolerant native speakers. That's true across the world in every culture and every language. Um, so of course some people will be more forgiving than others. But what we want for our learners above all is clarity and success in communication. We want them to experience a successful exchange so that they have they have a form. They use it for a function and they get feedback that that function worked. I knew what you meant. I knew where you were going. Even if they are perhaps making an error in pronunciation or more likely in grammar, because when we do a lot of oral input, we don't get a ton of errors with pronunciation, but we do get, of course, errors in grammar. A lot of times it's the grammar that they haven't seen yet, they don't know yet or they haven't mastered yet, so they're just using the one they know. So that, that can come out in the form, for example, of saying, um, I want to know, when what they mean to say is, do you want some food? Um, but a forgiving native speaker will get what they mean. Oh, wanting food, oh yeah, yeah, okay, food, yeah. As long as it's very clear. So we're trying to get them to a maximum accuracy, of course, but there's a margin of error. And so we're trying to maximize the clarity and again, they, that they'll get the most clarity if the chunks that we've given them are, the, are easy to grasp. If they've gotten lots of frequency, they've heard them a lot, they've had a lot of practice. So they're ready to produce them in a situation. So that means choosing high leverage chunks of language. And when I say that to learn to teachers, they always say, Yep, 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 and then when it, when it actually comes to planning units and planning lessons, most teachers hesitate and say, I'm not actually sure what you mean by that. I'm not actually sure how to apply that. And I want to validate that because it's actually super hard. It's actually super, super hard, and it takes lots of practice and iteration and trial and error to figure this out. Um, it's it's, it's going to be different by context. So again, there's no one size fits all that I can prescribe for you because you know the learning context, you know the target language, you know the target culture, and you know your learners and what they have already learned. So this is constant judgment that you're going to use, but there is some trial and error to it. And sometimes I've I've taught a, a lesson, given them a language chunk, and immediately after the lesson, thought, oh, I could have used it this way. And it would have been higher leverage for them. 
Why did I do it that way? That's okay. We're all learning. <laughs> um, but our real goal here is for students to be experiencing successes, able to commit acts of communication and get feedback that, yep, I got you, that worked inside the classroom and hopefully outside the classroom as much as that is possible for them. So that comes down to choosing the chunks that get things done that are the highest leverage. So I'm going to talk through a couple of choices that I made in creating the life jacket course. I forgot to mention in the previous video about why I came up with this clever name life jacket. <laughs> um, the idea is that they're going into immersion. So immersion is also a term for going into water, right? And that this course helps them stay afloat, stay afloat in the immersion. So it's their life jacket. So that's my clever name. Sorry, in case you're wondering why it has a weird name. Um, so life jacket is, is an extreme example of high leverage choices. Again, I tweak them all the time, but I have had great success with them because you saw how much people are able to do at the end of less than 20 hours of instruction. They're able to do a ton communicatively and quite clearly as well because they've been given such high leverage um, input and they've give, been given enough frequency with it that they really master that little chunk of language that they can do a lot with at the end of that course. So in every course I'm choosing high leverage chunks, but the, it's to an extreme degree in, in Life Jacket. And I'm going to talk through a couple of examples, but I will say that this video could could literally last for days and days and days because it's it's there's so much thinking and there's so many choices that go in to what is the most high leverage, what should go into life jacket, how should it be approached. Um, so I, there's really kind of no end to how much we could pick this apart, but I just want to talk through a few examples to help illustrate things that I chose and didn't choose and why and how contextual that is. So this is by no means telling you that these are the choices you should make in your course. For one thing, your learners may very well be more advanced in this, but it is ways of thinking. It's to model my, my thinking for you um, so that you take your factors into account and you come up with your decisions and then you try them out, you see how it goes. So let's look at the beginning of the course, natural place to start. As we said previously, this is where learners are at absolute zero. If they know anything about the language at all, it's probably five words or less, maybe 10 words or less. They really have no knowledge of the language. And so in this case, I start out with greetings. I will say that um, in many languages, I actually delete the greetings piece from, from the life jacket sequence. And I actually just greet them at the beginning of the lesson with a simple whatever hello is in the language. And I leave it at that. And I don't go deeper because what is my purpose here? My purpose is that they will complete Life Jacket and then move into a classroom, which is an immersion project-based classroom. The truth is you don't do a lot of greeting in a classroom where you already know everybody and where you come probably every day. Uh, you do say hello, of course you need your basic hello, but you'll pick it up. You'll pick it up so quickly from just being in the room. You 10 minutes in the room and you'll pick up what the greeting is. So they don't really need me to do much on greetings for the purposes of this course. So I know it's a natural thing that's programmed into us that all language courses start out with, hi, how are you? But actually in many languages, I would skip that and they would just figure it out. And that would be that. The reason I included it in the Dakota version of the course is because it's, it's for two reasons. One is that greetings are super important to Dakota culture and they're always done in a, in a pretty formulaic way. Um, and they carry a lot of meaning. So I don't actually provide a full exploration of all what we do with, with greetings in Dakota. They can't do intermediate level or advanced level greetings, which they would eventually learn because that's very important. But I do a little bit because it is so important to the culture. And the second reason that I do include it is because it's a real quick way, and you saw me doing it, you saw how obvious it can be, to introduce the fact that there are differences between the way men speak the language and the way women speak the language. Uh, that's harder to introduce in other ways. It, this is a real quick primer on that, as well as it gets out the, the word man and woman really quickly. So you saw how I did that in the first day. 
So that's actually super useful throughout the course to have established men's women, men's ways, women's ways, as well as uh, the words for man and woman. Um, it's very helpful. Uh, they reuse it many, many times. So I go ahead and keep the greeting because it actually ends up being worth our time. It's culturally important and we reuse those chunks that they learned in order to complete the greetings in many other communicative tasks that we learn in Life Jacket. So worth keeping. But like I say, in many languages, I would remove it. Let's talk about what I didn't include. Um, when I learned Dakota in a more a slightly more traditional setting, uh, I spent weeks and weeks learning greetings. All I learned was greetings for weeks. And I learned how to say, um, beyond hello, my name is, I learned how to say my parents' names, where I was from, where I live, what I what work I do. Um, I, pretty soon I learned my age, um, learned how to say whether I had children or not, what their names are, um, and what nation I'm from, whether we don't do that in this version of Life Jacket is um, many of those terms and, and that language, they will not use again. They will not actually use in that classroom that we're sending them to. So it doesn't actually line up with our immediate purpose for Life Jacket. Because once you go into a classroom and you're with people each day, it's it's not super crucial for you to explain where you live or what jobs your parents have or what your parents' names are. That's not something that you need in order to be able to participate in that classroom. And I have confined myself for the purposes of life jacket to just what you need in order to survive in that immersion classroom. So I have actually removed most of what we teach about greetings and just stuck to, hi, my name is, and the reason I kept my name is, even though within 10 minutes of being in a class together, we know that information is obvious. I could just give them name tags and we could skip it. The reason I give them my name is, is that one of the key things that they need to get out of this course is how to ask what things are called in Dakota, how to say, what is this? What is this in Dakota? What is this? How do you say this in Dakota? And they use that exact same verb. They say, I'm called Anka. This is called a pencil. This is called a cup. This is called a table. So they actually need that verb over and over and over again, very high leverage. So I have included, my name is, even though in many languages, I would skip that because again, it's so quick and so obvious. That's not something that really needs a whole lesson in this really tightly planned course for us. To um, going to the next day, you see that I have uh, taught them some feelings as a way to answer the, how are you? How are you? Very basic question. Um, but I've taken the time to really teach them a lot of feelings. And so if you look at the scaffold that I have built for them, um, and I do offer them this as something to read, here are some reasons why I do that. <laughs> First of all, people really answer with these, uh, with these feelings. Um, there's four or five answers that you pretty often get when you say, how are you? To people, unlike in English, where uh, I could just tell you real quick, people are going to either say good or fine. Let's move on. Um, in Dakota, you're going to get a variety of answers, and uh, they're going to be a little bit longer and a little bit more in depth. And so it's really good to be able to both understand them and use them, because that is what's really going to happen in that interaction. But the other thing is, uh, they contain uh, verb forms that they're going to get tons of frequency with, because we're going to teach this, we're going to practice it, and then I'm going to do it at the beginning of every class. I'm going to do, I'm going to just bore them to tears by saying each person, you'll, if you watch the videos of Life Jacket, you see me going to each person and saying, David, don't get down, huh? And he's going to say, yo, makpi, ah, yo, nikpi, washte, dok chan, And he's going to have to explain why is he happy? And we're going to do that. I'm going to just do it to death. Why? Because these are high leverage words. These are really high leverage words that they are going to use to build into a very high leverage construction that's coming up, which is why, because something you need to survive in an immersion classroom is why, because that interaction, to be able to ask why and be able to answer because. So a really easy way to start is a culturally appropriate feeling words. I feel happy. I feel sad. I feel tired. In response to the how are you question, that is going to load them up with 
words they're going to know really well. And then when I say, why are you happy? It's going to be very easy to teach them. I'm happy because a really good uh, scaffold, really good stepping stone for that more complicated interaction. As well as these are now conjugated verbs that they know really well, and they know the I version of them. You'll notice that the I version of these verbs actually takes multiple forms here. So if you look, you see chante mawashte. Um, that's a ma that has an infix. The infix there is ma that indicates me. Versus, if you go down to the second line, you see shte wada. That's wa infix, which is me. So they're actually getting a pretty complex picture of how verbs can be conjugated. Different types of verbs can be conjugated different ways without thinking about it. They're going to know all these by heart. They're just going to just rattle them off. And then later, when I want to get into basic verb paradigms, me, you, he, she, it's going to be easy to pull out these examples that they already know. And so you, if you look on the scaffold, I've actually created subsequent pages. So we will return to this in a couple of days down the line, and they will be able to clearly see how first, second, and third person are conjugated based on words that they now know very, very well because they've said them a million times and they've heard them a million times. So this, I, I packed those feelings in there because it's a good way for me to preload that. So the feelings are high leverage in that we do actually say them a lot. The forms of them are high leverage in that they contain verbal information that we're going to come back to later. It's super important. And I actually do use the writing, not only because there's a lot to remember. There's, I think there's nine emotions that I teach them, which is a lot to remember. And I let them look at that scaffold each day when they're asked, they can refer back and get that information. But it's also a really great chance for them to see the writing system. I don't ask them to write and I don't ask them to read in order to be able to pronounce because they are not familiar with this writing system yet. They don't know what the stress marker means. They don't know what the carrot on top of the S means or the carrot on top of the C means. And I don't assume that they do. They see this after I've already taught them They've, they've gotten lots of oral input and they've gotten gestures. So they're very clear on the form and they're very clear on the function before they ever see this written scaffold. And then I spend so much time reinforcing it during those one or two minutes at the beginning of every class that they're unconsciously probably internalizing what that writing system is, how, how that writing system works, because they know for sure how that word is pronounced and they see how it's being transcribed. And that allows them to infer, oh, when the S has a carrot on it, it's actually a sh. Without my teaching that, I am going to teach that, but after life jacket. I'm going to teach that once they get into their full classroom. Um, so right now I'm just giving them a peek at it, which prepares them for when it starts to be really important, including looking things up in the dictionary. You see that when we go, move into having and not having, I start them out with man and woman. And of course I use dolls. So it's um, not, I, I don't mean the way that we might say it in Dakota to mean I have a wife or I have a husband um, because I don't, I don't want it to become too personal or, uh, or to elicit too much laughter. And so I actually just use uh, the cards, the images, and we do the go fish game. Do you have the man? Do you have the woman? Um, as a way of saying, do you have, yes, I have, no, I don't have which is extremely high leverage, of course, and they need it immediately when they enter into an immersion classroom because the immersion classrooms that are project-based language learning uh, based, they involve group work. And so immediately you have to say things like, do you have the scissors? Do you have the paper? Do you have the instructions? Um, I, don't have, I don't have any scissors. These are words that they're immediately going to need, chunks that they're imme immediately going to need. And so I wanna make sure that they have have and not have it's really super crucial. And of course, other things, even online we use, we don't have class tomorrow. Very important information that I need to get across to them. They need to understand you have or we have. Um, so I use that with the wichashta we on the man woman that they've already learned from the first day when we did the greeting. Very easy to understand because that's a known quantity. And so have and don't have, high leverage chunk combined with known quantity, 
lot, lots of repetition, very well mastered. No question that they're going to have that. And then when they've mastered the chunk of have and don't have, I can start introducing all kinds of new objects or people that they could have or not have because they understand have and not have. So we start to do uh, a, a set of animals and we start to do a set of key classroom items. Now, there is a tradition in colonial language teaching that has a section very early on where they learn all, all the vocabulary of the classroom. They learn pencil case, they learn eraser, they learn shoe rack, they learn coat rack, they learn poster, they learn a wall, they learn lights, they learn drawers, they learn all these kinds of things because the idea, this is a theme-based teaching. Well, here's the theme, the theme is the classroom, here's all the words in the classroom. Which of those am I really going to need quickly when I enter that project-based language learning classroom and often. Shoe rack, probably not the key thing. If it ends up being key, someone will teach it to me and I will get it. But lots of classrooms don't even have shoe rack. That doesn't need to be in there. Wonderful case. It depends on the setting. If it's important in that setting, I'll get it. But what I really need is the ability to say, the thing you put the pencil in. I'll get that word. So I definitely need to learn pencil. I've gone through and I really picked that apart. I've given them a home, TP, a building that works for home or building, because to say school, you need building, you need uh, um, a TP. You need to be able to combine those, as well as the concept of going home. In classroom communication, doing this at home, doing this at school, um, so I've given them that, even though we're not actually going to spend time during Life Jacket talking about homes or buildings or houses. I've given them other classroom items like paper and book, because I know that they're going to be really important. And also they're really easy to use in combination with a really key interaction that is coming up in a couple of days, which is where is the, and Another one that's coming up even sooner, which is give me the, give me the book, give me paper. And actually in Dakota culture, they can say, just give me paper. They don't need to learn a different construction. Like, would you please hand me some paper? We don't have that, that politeness construction. So it actually go goes real quick. I have paper. Do you have paper? Give me the paper. Here you go. Very simple. So I've really pared down to the items that I know for sure that they're going to need and also that are going to be easy to teach. They're gonna get them. I'm gonna show them a picture. They're gonna get it right away. And then they're going to be able to reuse that in lots of the instructions that we're going to learn. You see that on the fourth day I teach numbers. Why do I teach numbers? Is it because we're gonna do a lot of counting? No. Is it because we need to do math right away? You're going to do math, but not now. Why do we teach numbers? One main reason. They need to be able to understand. They don't necessarily have to perfectly produce times, but when you're in a classroom, in a school setting, you really need to be able to understand the teacher when the teacher is giving you instructions around time. So even in, in Life Jacket, I'm going to say things like, you have five minutes, you have 10 minutes, and then um, in a live classroom, they're going to say things like at 10 o'clock in the morning, you need to be here at nine o'clock, you need to leave at three o'clock, they need to understand those things. So in order to do that, the at o'clock, the, the construction that makes it into a time is a, is a next step, they'll learn that later. But definitely they have to recognize that number so that when someone is telling a time, they're very likely to infer, oh, that was a time. Oh, that three, that was for the time three really important. So even, so counting to nine actually isn't really very useful. Um, of course it can, it can be useful and give me two pencils that, that can be useful, but nine, we don't usually use nine, but the reason I have them go all the way up to nine and, and then they eventually see 10 and 11 and 12 is because they do actually need to know the times. That's why it's high leverage. 
it's actually hard to teach the knowing and not knowing because it's hard to express knowing and not knowing in terms of showing what I mean. Um, and there's always a little bit of ambiguity. Do I mean understanding? Do I mean uh, thinking? What do I mean? So I do as much as I can with the scaffold to be really clear about the meaning. And then I also try to provide the function during the lesson in a way that differentiates it. So I, I do enough repetition in ways that splits it off from other possible meanings. So for example, someone might think Stodwayeshni means I don't think. Possible. I've had students go a little sideways with the function there. And so I will do things like hold up Chapa Chuita, everybody knows his name, and say, What's his name? We've learned what's your name? What's what's my name? What's his name? We've learned that. So I'll say, What's his name? And then I'll say, mm. and they will say, so they know that I wasn't saying, I don't think. I'm clearly saying, I don't know. So I use those known quantities to re remove the ambiguity from the function of this. But of course, this is extremely high function for them. Not only because when you go into an environment, environment, but especially a new environment, you have to be able to express all the things you don't know and all the things you want to know and to volunteer when you do know. That's very, very key. But also, these are very low level language learners. They don't have much language. And so they're going to say a thousand times a day, what is this called? I don't know. What is that called? I don't know. Do you know? I don't know. They're going to say that a million times. So I've loaded that up front, even though I've not, I've not saved it for a later unit. This is theme-based teaching where I would do um, thinking, knowing, wondering, dreaming, guessing, inferring, but, 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 but no, 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 this is utility based. So it comes very early on. We do the form, we do the frequency, uh, we do the function. It's all clear to them and they practice it a lot because they're gonna use it every day after that. If they, if they don't say it themselves, they're gonna hear it said. Do you know? I know, I don't know. Very key for them. So I've loaded it way up front. I've not saved it for a theme uh, that has something to do with that, which is that's the downfall of theme-based teaching is that a few of those things on that theme are actually useful to me right now. Most of them are not. And I have to wait a long time until we get around to that theme to learn the things that I actually need. Theme-based teaching, I have no recommendation to use theme-based teaching. We're doing communicative teaching. What do I need to do something? And this is something that I need in order to be able to do. And then you see in days five and six that I've done some things that might be even more surprising. First of all, I've introduced directions, not natural directions, north, south, east, and west, even though you could argue that those are very important in Dakota culture. Why wouldn't I teach those? The reason I don't teach them is because they don't need to know them in order to survive in the project-based language learning classroom in the first few days. They'll come up, they'll absolutely learn them. They're very important. They'll probably sing a song with them and everything. They have huge cultural significance, but I don't need them to survive. What I do need in order to survive is how to give and receive instructions. And that's really important. So I start out with go up, go down, go to the left, go to the right. When are we gonna use this? Well. Tons of games. So we already introduced some games, but of course there's going to be lots of games, hopefully, in their project-based learning classroom. As, as well as I need this in order to find things like the bathroom, like the like the book on the shelf, um, the the letter you're referring to on the board, whatever. I need these in order to find things and not feel embarrassed because I don't know where things are. So I've chosen the directions that are going to be highest leverage for them in the sense of finding things, locating things. And then the reason I started with those is because it's very obvious, and I put those into a game situation, that I'm giving an instruction. Go up, go to the right, go to the left. That's going to become so obvious. That is a great time for me to teach how this language gives instruction, how to recognize when you are being given an instruction and how to give an instruction, how to differentiate between saying, I'm going to the right, and go to the right. This is really important if you're going to be able to participate in the classroom and if you're going to be able to do group work. 
So I needed something where the context will be obvious so that the function of this language specific way of giving instructions will be easy to pick up on. And in this case, we have a specific language marker that is used, but most languages have a verb form that is specifically reserved for giving instructions. So that's very important that they know how to both give and understand instructions. So I've loaded it very early on and you could have used a lot of different uh, types of, of verbs, uh, content to teach it, but I did it with the, with the movement directions because it allows them to play games and it's high leverage content for them as a person who is new to a space and lost and doesn't know where things are. So those are an example of some of the choices that I made in Life Jacket. As I say, we could go on forever, but you have your own context. So you can choose from those frameworks that I used to make your own decisions in each unit, in each lesson, which of these chunks is the highest leverage, even if it's not necessarily the most natural or the most idiomatic, Will it be clear and can it be reused for lots of purposes? And it's therefore the most worthwhile for my students to get the most bang successful communication for their buck instruction.